I'm allowed to start now. So welcome everyone, <coughs> thank you very much for coming. Um, it wasn't a small journey, we actually even have someone here from South Africa, so can't see him right now, but please be welcome. So, um, as many of you probably noticed, this meetup got quite some attention. We <laughs> received positive feedback, but we also received some negative feedback. And so to start off, before I tell you about the agenda and give a short introduction to Dr. Craig Wright, I would like to read you a citation that I found, which clearly shows the intention and the beliefs of the Bitcoin Association behind every meetup that we do. Without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as liberty without freedom of speech by Benjamin Franklin. So I kindly ask you to keep this in mind today um, during the, the talk of Dr. Craig Wright and also during the Q&A. So. <laughs> One more moment. Yes. So shortly to the agenda. First, First, we're going to have Lucius Meissner, who's going to give a short general Q&A together with Dr. Craig Wright. And afterwards, I will give you a short introduction on persona, Dr. Craig Wright. Of course, I have a couple of insiders. I was able to ask him again before the meetup, mm -hmm. um, some things he might be able to read. And after that, Dr. Craig will Wright will give you his presentation. And to finish off, we will have some Q&A. So please Thank enjoy. You. Thank you. So uh, you might know me. I'm uh, Lucius Meiser. I'm one of the founders of the Bitcoin Association and a member of the board together with Ben and uh, other fellow board members that are here today. So uh, I'm here to address the elephant in the room. So the <laughs> there are a few things about your past that uh, people think about and that also uh, got us into some kind of uh, shitstorm. So when we announced uh, this meeting, uh, we got attacked on Twitter, we got attacked mm -hmm. on Reddit, we got angry emails from, from previous speakers that demanded their names to you be removed from the websites. wanted you to ensure that you had censorship so that you could have censored um, conversation about something that's not meant to be censored? Maybe. So that th would have been my first question. What do you think? made them so angry? Why do they demand this talk to be not take place? If anyone wants to dig up the archived Twitter feeds that I deleted in a sort of panic in 2015, you'll notice that I talked to Mr. Todd, I talked to Mr. Back, and we had been running simulations back then, um, and no, we didn't sell at that point. Um, I was already involved with this guy. My son had already moved to England in May, of 2015. I'd moved in um, October of 2015, months before the little incident. And I'd been discussing a number of things to do with uh, scaling. And basically, as uh, a group we've now funded, Bitcoin Unlimited, have demonstrated, on laptops, they have scaled to one gigabyte. On laptops. Mm -hmm. We, on big luster systems that cost much money, scaled to 340. And that's where I started talking to people and that's where I started having problems. Yes, I experienced similar problems. So I share this idea with the increase of the block size. I helped Mike Hearn a little with uh, Bitcoin mm -hmm. Classic. I supported his idea and uh, today I'm banned from Bitcoin Talk. So uh, <laughs> this is, so that's one. Join the club, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you also angered me a little, to be honest. And one thing that angered me is mm -hmm. when you promised to prove that you are Satoshi Nakamoto, and then in the last minute you changed your mind. And I think this is something that uh, also disappointed a lot of others. And that's also why people sometimes call you a con man or a, a someone who... Did anyone offer to pay me money? The first thing of fraud is money. So there is the story that you received 15 million in a deal in a, uh, where, where you agreed to what, out yourself as a What Satoshi deal Nakamoto. for 15 million dollars? Sorry? What deal for 15 million dollars? I so get paid it, the minimum amount I can have to stay in the UK right now. So the minimum, to the dollar, the minimum. It doesn't go up every year. 
I get paid that amount of money which doesn't even cover my rent. So this is an internet rumor. I don't know whether this is true or not. It so was said, yes. But where's the evidence? It's just an assertion. I haven't been paid that money. You will look at the court cases that I had and we filed tax. In 2014 I paid tax. In other years I paid tax. In other things I paid tax. And no, I don't have a $15 million deal. I had a company in Australia and I've got deals to build um, some of that. I had a deal to, um, to sell 20 patents was my original deal. And I believe we're about to hit 200, so. And I'm still there, and I haven't been sacked, as everyone says, um, so I guess that one's Good. wrong too. Yeah, so uh, one thing I would like to ask the audience is, uh, who came here because they believe that Craig Wright could be Satoshi Nakamoto? So please raise your hand if you do so. I'll tell you, if you need to believe I am, you've lost. I don't want your belief. Contrary to what people said and say, I was actually a pastor in the past. Um, I was involved heavily with the United Financial Association and I've given details of this to Bernard and whatever else, so they've been verified and you guys can send them round. I was a trustee of the Uniting Financial Association, uh, which is a, the church bank. It ran about $5 billion worth of assets as a bank. Um, so yes, I'm a banker, as terrible as that may seem. We made profit as a church. That went round to helping single mothers, to helping fund churches, to helping fund Burnside, which is a charity I supported for many years. So yes, we made profit because, well, otherwise, if we don't have profit, that terrible dirty word, I mean, it's Presbyterian, not Catholic, so profit's actually a good thing. So, yeah, so uh, to get across my point, so I agree with that, you should not So there, there's a point for uh, you. Yeah. Do you realise there were two churches of Satoshi? Not one, two. Anyone know how offensive that is? Do you have to believe, not because of an idea, but a person? And I'll, I'll apologise right now, I didn't handle 2015 terribly well, I didn't handle 2016 terribly well. I haven't really been in the spotlight before this. I had lots of people trying to train me up um, and do things and want a whole lot of things in May. Um, not so much this guy, he was more supportive, but others. And that was not so much about Bitcoin, it was about what other people wanted. And I got led and I was in that position, uh, running around from December 2015 with all sorts of things. With a search warrant that I was doxed on that, do you know what the, one of the names on that search warrant was? No. Satoshi Nakamoto. The raid was for that individual. So, good. So, but you agree that we should, that's what you write, ideas matter not the people they come from. So it's the ideas that matter. And that's, so I want to give you three reasons, three bad reasons to listen to him and finally one mm. good reason. So the first bad reason is, would be to listen to him be, because you think he's Satoshi Nakamoto. That's completely wrong, so you should... Am I coming here telling you to listen to me because I'm Satoshi Nakamoto? No, that, that's I want you to listen to facts, to ideas, and empirical evidence. I don't want you to believe a thing I say unless it is supported. Not, we can't scale. I want to show you we can scale because we independently run things. Everything that Peter Risen is doing at the moment, we've already done. Um, I'm terrible I, uh, with Stefan and everything like that. We're funding a whole lot of projects because I've already done them. Because you don't need to believe me. It's very simple. I can put out there and I, can, I know the results and it's a great way to run a business when you can actually fund things you know work. Yes, so, but there's some inconsistency. Some, so what, one point that goes a little against this is that you're using your title a lot. So whenever, even on Twitter, you call yourself Professor Faustus. 
And, uh, but I think you have two PhDs, is that uh, correct? Um, yes, and I was actually a lecturer at um, Charles Sturt um, University for many years, uh, as well as other places. Yes, so the lecturer is not a professor, so I think that Twitter handle uh, is not quite accurate, is that right? Um, that's an old Twitter handle and I at no point say that I am a university professor. Do you know the story of Faust? Yes, Marlo. yes, uh, yeah, I had that back in high school. So, no, no, not my, the common one, Marlowe. <laughs> Julius Marlowe's Faust. What was the story of Faust? You mean uh, Goethe's uh, Faust? Marlowe's. No, I don't know yours Faust. <laughs> ah, it's a very interesting story. It was very popular in the 16th century. Faust was basically obscure and always remained obscure. Faust sold his soul for one thing. That's Goethe's Faust, right? No, well, Goethe also took the same story. It was originally <laughs> Marlowe. The fact that someone rewrites it. I mean, if you look at Romeo and Juliet, there's a new version. It's called West, Co West Side Story. I mean, you can say whoever's version, whatever you want, but at the end of the day, Faust, as he originally happened, gained infinity at a cost, and that's what it was about. Good. So and the, the other question for you, what does professor mean? So a professor, in Switzerland at least, it's a title you gain from a habilitation. Just by, I'm a lecturer myself at university, but professor, I'm not a professor. Um, and if you look at some of the way I've spelt it on um, uh, Facebook, professor is exactly teacher. Yes, so you are using it in that original sense and not yes. in, a, in an official sense. Good. Correct. So, and so regarding your uh, uh, PhD, so you said you, you answered a few questions uh, and one of your an answers was I, uh, I did not want to have to prove uh, or validate my qualifications publicly. I see this as an invasion of my privacy. So on the one hand, you're saying you're using your title all the time, but on the other hand, you say it's something private and you, you don't want to validate it. Um, no, I said I didn't want to validate everything. I can use doctor in validating one degree. I don't need to show you two. So did you actually validate you one doctor degree? Did you, is I've there a proof? I, there's several bits of proof on the internet already. There's my thesis on the internet already. There's other ones. There's several master's degrees. There's the university page that has God knows how much about me back then. So I'm most interested in the PhD proof and the mm -hmm. one you link on your LinkedIn profile is this piece of paper. So this is just the list of credit score. It has no official signature or anything. I also brought you my two titles to show what they look like normally. So <laughs> So this is my master's in computer science. <laughs> and this is my master's in uh, economics. So I have much fewer masters than you have, but at least I have these two in my hands. I couldn't and fit all mine. I'm sorry. I'm not going to prove everything. Oh, I hear something coming. So we got Doctor of Philosophy, that's a nice Very nice, congratulations. So, uh, uh, have a look? Unfortunately, they broke the glass on me. Okay. Uh, yeah, Master of Science, Information Systems Management. Do you want to see this, this in the camera? Which one do you want to see? Grab me the um, folder, by the way. The little folder. Maybe, uh, the little folder because I took some out because can you sh sh show this to the camera or make a picture just uh, <laughs> so uh, this is what you were missing so that's a master's in statistics yes I don't care about the masters so much so <laughs> <laughs> well they matter this is a master of science in information security engineering so yes I'm an engineer yeah uh, this is a master of law with commendation so I'm an evil lawyer. I actually sat at the bar too. Do you want me to go into that? <laughs> um, yes, that's my academic transcript. See? Yeah. It's got the little thingy at the bottom if you want to touch it. 
total award. Uh, so I got a Master of Network um, and System Administration, a Master of Management, Master of Information System Security, uh, got lots of silly things for these stupid little university things. Oops. Basically a big pile of crap. So, do we want to go through everything and waste all, all night or? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so, go ahead. Um, are you so, happy now? Thank you, that's much better than the other document you provided so far. So, uh, the thing is, mm -hmm. the so as an academic myself, I know that uh, you should still judge the ideas on their own merit because there are lots of academics that are still very incompetent. Mm -hmm. So uh, a title, you can have an excellent title but still not know that much. And this brings me to the uh, third thing. So why you shouldn't listen, what would be a bad reason, li reason to listen to him? <coughs> and that bad reason would be because we invited him. So as <laughs> So as uh, Lucas pointed out on our blog, and, uh, this is not an endorsement. We provide a platform for free speech, as you said. So some of, you, uh, some of us agree with you, some of us agree less. Like uh, I watched your talk in uh, Holland, mm -hmm. and uh, as, uh, on the blog size I, I mostly agree, on other things I disagree. But that's, I think that's up to everyone to decide for themselves. There's one thing that actually acts as proof. It's called evidence. If we want to test a system, we can do it mathematically. And mathematics is an absolute proof. In cryptography, we like to skip because we say, with an assumption that we have the discrete logarithm uh, problem being difficult or something like that. And as long as those assumptions hold, it's a proof. We can even go further and we can mathematically prove things to base fundamentals, but that's hard so everyone skips it. That's one form of proof. The other is to do it. I love annoying the buggery out of people in the office because I've got this thing, uh, I love the bumblebee theory, which is if you can do it, it's possible. I don't give a rat's rectum what the hell any theory in science says, if I've done it, if I can repeat it, if someone else can repeat it, your theory's wrong. That's it. Good, so thank you. I want to conclude with five reasons why I believe he's not Satoshi, just <laughs> uh, to, to round things up. So, one is, uh, so Satoshi Nakamoto was known to be very soft-spoken, considerate, even shy. But you have been uh, cursing online in Twitter and uh, on camera, uh, online and offline. So this is one thing <laughs> which hints at uh, change of character. There's I'll, I'll interrupt there and say, um, I'm not going to attempt to prove I am. I'm not going to do anything like that. I don't want you to try and believe me because you think I am. Yes. I want evidence alone. And the simple answer there is I'm not always a complete utter bastard. I'm Australian, um, so there's always at least a little bit of utter bastard in us. Um, it, it's just, well, we're yep. Australians. We're, we're generations of convicts sent from everywhere in the world. Um, now, at the end of the day, it's quite simple. I didn't want any um, media, I didn't want any coverage, and the next thing I find is uh, I've got it everywhere. These things, because I don't go to motherboard and I don't hold up a certificate and dance around, suddenly I'm a fraud. You're because I don't wheelbarrow in. So you've now been using it. your title for a long time without actually proving it, which invites some It's on the CSU website. I actually looked at the website and didn't find it. So... Well, Maybe uh, my Googling skills are not good enough, but uh, obviously you it, can get nice a link from me on later. Paper it's here. on the archive.is from 2003. So, so. I was ma mainly looking for the PhD, but let's uh, continue. So another thing is, uh, uh, it, there's a claim that you, so the Satoshi Nakamoto obviously didn't trust the financial system. 
but you ah. seem to have locked up your wells in a Singapore trust. Is that right? Where, sh show me where one single, single comment about not trusting the financial system exists. And don't give me the Genesis block because that was actually the Times and on page 1, 3 and 67, that article covered, anyone know what it actually covered before I say it? In what way? Who actually read the article that everyone loves to quote and say what it means? I'll tell you what it actually said. The Chancellor had given bailouts already to the banks. And the Chancellor threatened the banks. He said if they don't spend these propping up the housing market, he will buy their toxic assets. What he was talking about was their shares. The Chancellor of Britain said he was going to force nationalisation by printing bonds to buy out the major banks in Britain if they didn't do what he said. Read the article. That is the gist of it. Do you know what happens when a central bank decides to run national policy by buying out banks? because they won't do what they've been told. Naughty, naughty commercial institutions, I know. They had enough risk, they had enough loss, and they refused to stop housing losses getting any worse by propping it up by making it worse. That is what that article actually was. So, don't trust me on that. Read it. So Ben is pointing the watch, let me speed it up a little. So another thing is, uh, cypherpunks are known to be very critical of software patents, including Satoshi Nakamoto, but you have more than 100 patents pending, is that right? Uh, I've got one that's a full patent and I've got uh, close to 200 now, yes. So how uh, did you change your attitude? So where's Satoshi actually say patents are bad? So this is, no, this is my assumption because it ah. fits the cypherpunk spirit. So, but let's move on. Another thing is... Uh, no, 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 but that, 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 no, no. <laughs> you, you've just made a claim. This is evidence, remember? Where is the foundation of this assumption? So it's a shaky foundation, but it, it's an interesting point. Because if you're... You see, we have this image of uh, cypherpunks with these... Uh, and what are they? They're libertarian. They're libertarian. They don't like patents. They don't like ah, financial uh, systems. Again, they don't an like assumption. <laughs> Who's read Ayn Rand? So, uh, cypherpunks don't Ayn like Rand patents. Ayn Rand is libertarian. That's, uh, known. Eb Ayn Rand is libertarian. Ayn, La Ayn Rand said patents and copyright need to be controlled so they don't grow out of control but they also are valuable because there is one thing, one thing in this universe that us humans have that no other thing does that distinguishes us. It's our thought, our mind. It is the work we do with our mind. Not digging a hole, making a Keynesian pyramid and digging a hole to fill back up again. What we think, our ideas are what create society. Our ideas are what promulgates growth our ideas are the heart of capitalism and we have rights to those. We have the right to withhold information. We have the right to choose who we sell to. We have the right, we have the privilege and the obligation to protect what we have. If we choose to give something for free, that's our choice. And we're going to give some of the patents away to Bitcoin Cash and then go, hey, Ethereum can't use them. And guess what? That's our right. If we invent it and no one else does, and we patent it and no one else does, our right. And you know what? Here's another thing, a little quote from Dyson. Dyson came out when he was attacked on patents because he has several hundred. He came out saying, the biggest drive for innovation that we have is because of patents, because it stops people sitting on their laurels. Every time someone creates a patent, someone else finds a way to do it 
a different way. And that's not something a cypherpunk would say. So and the that next is something point is a cypherpunk <laughs> would say. So I disagree, but let's move on because uh, we have uh, more important ideas to hear later. So one, uh, my second last point is so Satoshi Stefan Thomas, who I know, he analyzed all posts by Satoshi Nakamoto and found out he was never online between 7 and 11 GMT. And at that time, I think uh, you lived in Australia, right? Uh, no, he didn't find that he was never online. He found different combinations. I lived in a few different locations and moved around a lot. Um, and you'll also find what he was assuming is that the post time for Australia would be around maximum of lunchtime, you know, when people work. Um, the times when people have at home between the hours of 5 and, um, and 10 to 12 at night, well, anyway. Um, on top of that, if you look at my Slack times, uh, even now in Britain, you'll find them on quite often at 3 in the morning. And I live in Britain. Yes, but today GMT. you are online between 4 and 9, that's the Australian time when he was never online, and today you do. So it's, uh, it's just a hint at that the moment might I am. You, Six so. months ago I wasn't. So, and the next thing is uh, the final point. So Satoshi was always very concise. So he could bring points across very easily. But we have spent half an hour on something now that should have taken 10 minutes. <laughs> That's my Would you point. prefer? You. Would you prefer that I left everything and said something concise like, if you don't believe me, I don't care, which I tried. <laughs> That's also fine. OK, thank you. I'm going to make my introduction very short. I'm Australian too, so I know I know part of my heritage. I'm a bit of a bastard too, apparently. <laughs> um, good thing to know. <laughs> OK, so I asked him the famous question I already asked Amir, actually, and what brought you to Bitcoin? So there were several events that led to this interest. And so the first one was in 1997, when Tim May published his Black, Black Net, which is basically a dark internet of payments. And um, so in 2001, he then registered that as a formal R&D project with the Australian government. And following, or during this time, 1997... Which isn't a good thing to do, by the way. <laughs> so during the time, 1997 and 2006, he was heavily involved also in the gaming on the online gaming space and built one of the first online casinos, by the way, in case you didn't know. So obviously, he was Which always... Which was Australian too, by the way. Obviously. And um, so he was always very involved into the whole online payment things. And one thing that he definitely wanted to solve was have a different payment system that wasn't... that doesn't include the correspondent payment system. So obviously cash. And um, so I think... A lot of these events led to him in being interested in, in a cash system that, for example, the US couldn't control. And so that one thing led to another, and that was the In start. particular, the US controls correspondent banking. Anyone who has been involved in early days in anything like gaming or, um, well, 90% of the, the internet back in the day, uh, won't go into that, uh, will know that correspondent banking is a good way of stopping everything for morality issues. It's a good way of censoring the internet. Mm. Yeah. So. Well, I have nothing more to say. I'm going to leave you to it. I think you've already started a little bit and I don't want to stop the whole Bitcoin talk. So All please right. enjoy and um, welcome on stage, Dr. Craig. Thank you very much. Thank coming. you very much. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about a few little things that we think Bitcoin can do. We're going to talk about hoarding, equity, end of debt and credit as we know it, and all these terrible things that obviously um, cypherpunks would hate like banks, because I don't hate them. I don't like central banks, and there's a big difference. I actually think banks are good. And Bitcoin does not replace banking at all. Contrary to what people think, it's a payment and cash system. It doesn't replace banking. It can do, in SegWit 1 or 2, less than 1% of a SWIFT system. Useless, in effect. As a full payment cash system, it's different. Banks allocate risk. Banks allocate capital. You don't get loans and you don't buy houses um, unless you save up with Bitcoin. And there are people who say you should save and all this stuff and we should go back 200 years. We're in a different society, we're a different world, 
and companies need to be able to get access to money and capital. So we're going to talk about some of these things and we're going to talk about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency and what it really means. It's first of all immutable. Now that means we have a record that doesn't change. Anyone who's done a little bit of accounting or anything will know there are multiple ways of running your books. You can run your books where you can actually edit the records and you can run them where you have a read-only record and you have to actually put in another entry to say that you screwed up and you have to fix it. Bitcoin's the, we have to fix it by um, putting another entry and actually leaving records of where it has been changed. And that's important in my opinion. The fact that you can go back and alter a record five, ten years down the track has been the source of many, many frauds and problems throughout history. Enron being one, many changes. Um, we look at um, the Madoff sort of Ponzi that we had. All of these things were not possible with Bitcoin. So that's a different view of the world. Where does it start? And this is the pervasive and infecting and corrupting cancer of an idea that has been around for many years. Mercantilism. This is old. This goes back and this is why the wealth of nation, uh, nations was actually written, because of this idea. Adam Smith wasn't saying we need to be capitalist. He was saying mercantilism is bad. We need, the same as the French were saying, laissez-faire. We need freedom. We need open trade. We need the ability to be able to do, as a merchant, as a consumer, what we can do without someone telling us what the value of our money is. But governments love this because wealth is power. How much gold you have, how much of a treasure chest you have sitting there. That's what mercantilism is really about. This is the problem with things like gold standards because no, getting this tangled up, people don't really understand what it's about. Mercantilism and gold is about power. That's what it's all about. It's not about opening up systems and allowing things. It's about how much bullion do we have? How much silver specie? And it's all about the state. Mercantilism started because the state started. There wasn't such a thing if we go back to the time of, um, say, the 11th century and the early Crusades or anything like this. There was banking, there were many things, there was a king, but there wasn't a state. It wasn't until the 15th and beyond centuries that we started creating states. And that's where we started national wealth, where we had to start actually hoarding to build ships so that we could capture more wealth, so that we could build more ships to capture more wealth. So, what is this? We have this thing called bullionism, economic nationalism. We have the idea that the more money we hoard, the more money, the more power we have. And the British were very, very good at this for a time. They basically did a lot of capturing after things. But the worst, if we go back, were the Spanish. The Spanish basically took the silver trade, pieces of eight, etc., and ripped apart Europe. And there's no other way to put it. As they ripped apart South America, they ripped apart Europe. And you know what the Spanish have out of that? They have a debt and a legacy now that is still with them, where they don't really work anymore. They believe they can sit there and wait and things will happen because we had money, we were powerful. That's the problem with bullion. That's the problem with hoarding. People start believing in the story rather than the idea of work. They start thinking that goods aren't as important as a lump of money. Not actually understanding what money is. Money is liquefied future goods. It is a call from what you've done now on society in the future. It is 
whatever's out there. If I have a certain money base and I have 1% of that, then I have, when I spend that money, 1% of the goods of society being created then. Not 1% later on, unless I spend it later on. I have the right to call at that point. That's what money's really about. So this is where the fallacy came in, where Adam Smith actually corrected things. Money is truly about what we're creating. It's the amount of goods and services, how productive we are, how efficient we are, what as a society we do to create more. Not what we think about leaving and losses and winners and losers and whatever else. Not a zero-sum game. I read The Economist a little while ago and they were talking about trade losses between China and America. They were talking how the growth of China is going to take away from the US. That's bunk. The growth of China will not take away from the US. It will grow the pie. If I have more because I've created more, not because I've got to pile more money, but because I've made something, I take nothing from you. The problem and the fallacy that we love to teach everyone, especially the Occupy movement and things like this, is Africa and Asia, they're poor because we rape them and take their money and their country and their goods. World trade from Africa is less than 1% of anything created in the US. Africa is poor not because we take stuff from Africa, it's poor because we don't trade with Africa. Nothing happens. We don't deal with them. And we can't deal with them because the people can't deal with us. I spent time in Ghana and I spent time in India. And I saw people and they don't have money. They don't have goods. They don't have anything to be able to trade. That's the problem. And these are people who will wheel, deal, do anything to make money because they have families to support. Africa, it's a large country. It has massive opportunity potentially, except for one little problem. It doesn't produce anything. And we talk about the idea of moving into Africa and giving them solar panels. And I'll tell you right now, that's the most useless, stupid idea I've ever heard. Because do you realize you can't build heavy factories with solar panels? I don't care, you cover the whole of Africa in solar panels. You don't make a, a car factory, ever. You cover the whole of Africa in solar panels. You don't get aluminium, ever. We're allowing people to be kept poor because we're not letting them trade. This is our problem. Alan, uh, we have this guy here, Adam Smith. I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of him. I've said it a few times. Back in 1776, six years after Australia got its first dumping of convicts, this guy up there in Scotland decided that, well, mercantilism is probably bad. In fact, we've got this non-zero-sum game. We have the idea that if we actually trade with people, we get more not less, not I have to beat you up and beggar my neighbour to do anything, but I can do a win-win scenario. It's not a zero-sum game. Trade is not about what I take. It's about what we give. Who's ever gone to a shop and tried to force someone to reduce their prices? Does it ever work? If they don't call the police? No. You deal with people because you interact and you deal with people as people. Not because you dictate what they have to do, like government does, but because you interact as a human, as a person who wants to give. Not because you necessarily care what the butcher's family does, or the baker's, but you interact, and you're friendly, and you're going to do things. And I should have turned that off. Yeah. What can I say? People calling me during these things. All right, so we have that, and this is what it was. 
It was why we had colonial expansion. It was the worst thing many people did. Do you know how much India made for Britain? Massive negative amounts. And Africa and everywhere else. The worst investment they ever did was this. Not what people think, not the great idea of making a beautiful um, world society. It didn't do any of it. It made a big hole in the budget and turned Britain from the uh, world power to where it is now, a little socialist pauper that no one really cares about. So, what can we do? We have this thing called e-commerce, b-commerce, people to people, whatever else. Now, we have things that can be done right now. People can learn right now. Not everyone has to be a complete wanker like me and just stay in university for the rest of his life. Um, some of you will actually go out and actually experience the real world. Um, obviously, as you see, I don't. <laughs> um, just finished my uh, last degree and I'm starting another one. So I'm, I'm weird that way. What can I say? Now, we have people who can go on things like Khan Academy and they can learn. We have degrees being offered online now and people can learn. People learn how to code. People learn how to develop. And we don't have the same sort of having to step people up anymore because everything gets cheaper. It gets less expensive every day. That's the beauty of all this. Not because they have to be equal to the most luxurious computer out there or whatever else, but because they can access the internet and it's going to be cheaper over time. So, only so much wealth in the pie. That's the old fallacy. I'll try and teach you this one in um, Bitcoin world too, for some reason. The reality is we need to expand the pie. Dynamic, open economies. We want people everywhere to trade. And the reason they don't in many places is because they can't get bank accounts, is one. They can't actually access funds, is another. They can't get access to capital. Not the silly, um, I'm not going to do anything ICOs or anything like that, but small amounts of equity. Being able to do lighthouse projects like Mike Hearn, who lives in this country now, was proposing. Little things. I want to do something in my village. How about I raise $100? That's doable. That's growing a pie. So we don't want to actually go out there and beat the banks. Bitcoin isn't about beating the banks. It's about transforming. It is about evolving. There is no battle here. There is no fight. We're not doing the same thing. And over time, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we're not going to be in the same world we had before. It is going to be completely and utterly different. We don't want to have to play the same game. Banks are never going to be offering bank accounts to poor guys in Ghana. One of the things, I've talked about this one before, if people have listened, is I found incredibly cool, and people find this weird, when I went to places like the Philippines or Ghana, I would watch people build houses. They'd buy besser bricks, they'd buy concrete, and they'd just build a little bit. And they'd build it sometimes over 20 years. And you can't sell a half-finished house, not for what it's really worth. You don't get your money back. It was a saving plan. And usually it was the wives who actually made it happen. The husband had to build it. Um, but usually what happened was the wife would make the husband do this because otherwise he would go and drink it away. And yeah, But it was a saving plan. So in 20 years' time, you have this larger house that now your bigger extended family can live in. It's a it's saving. But Bitcoin's better. Bitcoin without caps, open to the world, is better. Not so that people can run their own node and run around going, I've got my own node. It matters that you have your own money. No one can take your financial freedom because you have your keys. So, where it all started? Everyone knows the little history here. We had this whole 2008 bit 
Um, lots of people involved, uh, not so many lots, but a few people like um, uh, Bear still exist and pop up every now and again and then get shot down and trolled to buggery before he disappears once again. But the idea was this thing here, votes with computing power. And the fallacy is, and why a few people like Greg Maxwell say Bitcoin couldn't work back in the day, it's not democratic. One dollar, one vote. Capitalism isn't democratic, but it is free. It is free because my one dollar has the same rights as his one dollar. If I'm a billionaire, my dollar has the same rights to a pack of gum as his dollar. If I'm a pauper, my dollar has the same rights to her dollar. That's what it is. That's freedom. Not because I can be equal and force other people to do things, but the truth that it matters that I can actually have my money, not have it eroded by inflation, which is a big one. And that's a huge one. Most of the world's economies have been actually deflationary, contrary to what people try and tell you. The Roman Empire, for a long time, was deflationary. The amount of money supply was actually always less until the, um, about the third century AD than the amount of silver and gold that they were actually implementing to run everything, which makes it deflationary. That was the problem. We had a government who decided that they could shave and skim and mix more silver into the electrum, and no one would notice, apart from one little problem. You notice. If someone's making your coins lighter, you notice. So, what have we got? We've got this world where we've got these things, and I need to update this because three months and all these figures are wrong. We've got 71,000 hours of Pandora, a uh, quarter billion emails, 80 million photos, and that's in the last minute. That's what the internet does. This thing that, when I was involved back in the early 90s, people said, could never scale. Back then it seemed like it wouldn't. We had all these little slow modems and everything like that, and everyone said how the internet's terrible, it will never scale. I worked for an ISP called Pegasus, and then I worked for one called Aussie Mail, and we were told how you can't scale the internet. It's, you've got to move over to X500 uh, type protocols and, um, and cellular type transmissions because the internet's not efficient. Unfortunately, it did, and it is. And we have all these new technologies, um, sort of silly Gartner thing there, where we, everything's been connected. My house, I'm terrible. My wife hates it because everything gets connected. Light bulbs, literally, not figuratively. Light bulbs are connected. The lights themselves are connected. I've got a window wiping robot um, because, well, you can. It doesn't actually get used because my wife actually likes the cleaner that we have. Um, so I, I've got my gadget that I try and wheel out every now and again. And um, it usually just sits there until guests come over and I can show off how a robot can clean my window. And then it gets wheeled away. But we have all these things happening. So what do we have? We've got storage. First of all, it's an immutable ledger. It is history. Not because people think that's um, only for settlement use or whatever else, but because it can be used, like it was early on, for all sorts of records. We have digital assets or tokens. Ethereum only exists because people refuse to actually allow Bitcoin to do this stuff. The only reason. We have smart contracts automatic validation, external things, all of this can run on Bitcoin. And it's not now because we've been saying we can't scale. We have been for nearly 10 years saying we can't scale. In those nearly 10 years, IT has increased massively. Moore's law is working. I've got a paper coming out soon. It's in peer review at the moment. I had to pull it and update it. 
because when I put out the paper, I was commenting on um, how an, a three nanometer transistor had been discovered. And before the peer review process finished, some university over in um, uh, South Korea discovered a 1.5 nanometer transistor. Right now, there's this thing called the 5.5 uh, nanometer gate limit in physics. We cannot make a transistor smaller than 5.5 nanometers. There's only one little problem we have. 1.5 nanometers. We have. And scientists sit there going, but it can't work because quantum tunneling, yada, 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 theory says it, it, it isn't allowed to work. Except one little problem. It does. It's been replicated not only on the 3, but now on a 1.5. And we can sit there all day saying, human ingenuity will only get us so far. Except, where are we? We are in the golden age. The first, the only, the most magnificent part of human history. The only time we have a chance to cure poverty. The only time we have a chance to open up the world to trade, to stop war, to start a, stop all these things. We are in the richest, wealthiest, most productive part of human existence that 200 years ago, even Jules Verne um, type people, whatever else, uh, he's only 100 and whatever years ago, but even 100 years before Jules Verne, no one imagined. 100 years later with Jules Verne, he still didn't imagine. He had silly things out there that, um, well, we laugh at now. And he thought of a big submarine that could go underneath the earth, uh, sorry, underneath the ocean and even go underneath the poles. Um, anyone been up to somewhere like Archangel in Russia? No? I went there many, well, back in the 90s. And um, it's actually a, a submarine thing on the White Sea. And they basically, so the Americans don't see them, they go straight out under the Arctic in submarines that go for six to nine months underwater without having to surface. Which beats anything Mr. Ver um, Jules Verne actually thought of. So we have it. Now, we have this little computation rate. It doubles. Every 18 months, we double in computation. Every 15 months, we double in storage. And it's actually accelerating. It's not an even scale. It's actually getting faster, not slower, is the scary bit if you look at the real thing. But here's the other thing. It compounds. We are not just putting more transistors on a chip. We are building more chips. We are not just building computers with more transistors, we are building more chips in everything. You get glasses now with chips. You get sunglasses with chips. I'm sure someone watched Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with the whole glasses that go black because um, people have got sort of uh, chip glasses now that change for different reasons based on your mood and emotion. Someone came up with an extension to a product called Mindplay, which measures alpha waves and um, decided to play music when you feel certain ways, whether you like it or not. Don't ask me why, but we do it. So every 5.2 months right now, we double the rate of computational power on this Earth. Not Moore's law, faster. What we have, lots of people say we, we're going to hit limits. We've said that all through, like back there in 2005, Mr. Moore said, oh, uh, by 2005 we'll hit a limit. Um, he got his own law wrong. Let's see, we've got these other guys. Now, some of the guys over at CERN um, are basically giving up and saying, well, 2600 sounds good because then we hit the speed of light. And if we hit the speed of light, we don't think we'll get faster than that, so that's the end of Moore's law. Which, that's probably a good one. But I figure I'm probably not going to worry about 2600. 
I mean, I used to read Alt 2600, but I don't think I'll be here in that many years. So we need to think about what Bitcoin can do, not what we think it is attacking, not that it will break things, not that we tear down society. I'm not like many cypherpunks. I don't want to burn anything down. I want to build. I don't really care if banks exist or don't. I care that they're honest. I care that people have access to money. I care that businesses have access to equity. So, holy grail, no trust points. That's been our big problem, even with Bitcoin. How do we protect things? How do we ensure that we hold our keys? How do we ensure that someone doesn't do a Mt. Gox on us? That's a problem. How do I make sure I can't lose my keys? The more copies I have, the safer I am, and the risk increases. So it's a double-edged sword. So, what do we have? We have Bitcoin, which is our first brick. The reality is, it gives us a way of having an immutable ledger. It doesn't give us everything. It doesn't solve the world's problems. It doesn't distribute capital. It doesn't allow us to even be safe because our public keys are still easy to lose, to be stolen, to be copied, to be compromised. They still sit on exchanges. So, we had these guys, nice little fun photo there, the guy with the Mt. Gox, where is my money? Everyone remembers that one, I'm sure. Exchanges and web wallets hold your keys. That's a problem. They have control. Yes, they have passwords. Everyone remember Equinox. It's only a few weeks old now. Lots and lots of accounts being hacked. This is what we expect in the current model. It's why it's wrong. We need to change this. One of the things that we have patented and we're going to release and we're going to be mean, nasty, and totally evil, and only let it out on Bitcoin unless you pay us lots of money. So um, my, everyone hates it at work because my business strategy is the same way one I've had from Australia that everyone said is not a real business strategy. It's the under -name, uh, underpant gnome strategy, which is Bitcoin, number two, stuff, number three, profit. Very simple. And number two is easy enough too. We're going to make sure, not that we have a, a, a group of followers. I don't want followers. I want leaders. I want people who will grab ideas and run with them. And we will help. We will help with code, with IP and all the rest. And Stefan's nodding there. And we, we're already doing that with a few organisations. And no, I'm not going to tell you who they are quite yet. So we've got these things that I've got in these slides here, like thresholds. And after I was in Hong Kong, um, I had a guy from IBM come up to me and go, you can't do this. And I went, sorry, why? We've, we've got a patent on it. He went, um, I'm from IBM and we've been working on this for years and we haven't solved it, so you can't do it. And I went, but I have done it. And he went, no, if, you can't, if we can't solve it, then you can't. But um, everyone loves Big Blue, don't they? So anyway, um, we're not just doing a threshold. We're not just doing it in a normal Shamir methodology. The bits people haven't seen in where we're talking about all these funky things like interpolation and whatever else is this little bit at the bottom. What if your private key doesn't ever exist? What if we can actually use the key slices rather than recreating the key and then having it exist and trusting that someone will actually delete it in a homomorphic scheme that allows you to propagate transactions without ever having a private key, without ever having a way to lose a private key. That's what I've been doing. So, reliability. Think of RAID. We can do this for yourself. I can have part of my key on my phone, part of my key on my computer, and part in my mind. I can now couple that with lock time type contracts so that if I die, there's a way for my family to recover. I'm a control freak, my wife will tell you. I 
like to manage the you know what out of everything and she'll quite happily sit there and go, yes, Craig's a cable control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the simple thing is, I also want to make sure that if something happens, my family's taken care of. With Bitcoin right now, that's a problem. That's what we're going to change. And we're a research organisation. We are a think tank. Our business plans, my effectively underwear name ones. Yes, people will uh, partner with us and we'll do deals with shares and Stefan can work about all that shit because quite frankly I don't care. Um, <laughs> this is why I get in trouble with tax people because um, they say, what are you doing for business? And I, I go, well, I'm, I'm inventing stuff. And they go, how do you make money? I don't care. Um, so that's what we're doing. If you're incapacitated, you lose it. You have theft. Whatever else, you're safe. We can even take this further because we can match transactions on an exchange without the exchange knowing what the transaction has been matched. So we can do a blinded threshold system. So um, in the next year, we're going to have all this stuff coming out. And basically the idea would be the exchange doesn't even know what they're matching. So anyone who knows how an exchange works with the limit order book and all the rest and, and all the rest, and I'm sure there's plenty of Bitcoin traders here who sit there watching every little tick. We don't care at the exchange what you're actually trading anymore. And in fact, with the threshold blinding system, I could actually split the transaction between three separate exchanges and three separate continents and I'm only facilitating, I'm acting like the Australian Stock Exchange I used to work for used to do. They don't care about the trade, they're facilitating. And that's what we're going to do with a peer system. We're going to facilitate. We're going to allow people to publicly sign, open up documents, create, put records of contracts on the blockchain again. Everyone's used to do this. 2011, 2012, 2013, it was big. Then we sit there and say, we can't do it, it's spam. It's not spam. So, we are doing a dealerless distribution and we're going to extend some of these things so that we can sign code and generate signatures and you don't ever get the key. And no, we don't have a problem with the ephemeral K value either. So when you're doing, for those who know ECDSA, uh, the ephemeral version of the key, the K, that if you get that, you can reverse and get the private key. We don't care because that's also thresholded and shared. There's no 1K version. We have all this. And do you know what we need to change in Bitcoin to do this? Nothing. I do not need a single protocol change at all. So, whether people like it or not, it's going to happen. We can distribute key generation as much as we want. Another little thing we can do is we can reshare private keys without it having to be on a block. So, um, I've stolen some things from, from Sean and um, other people who came after him with these things. Um, and we have an updated version that does what Sean wanted without some of the vulnerabilities. We're not centralised, which means we don't need lightning because if I give you a share and I can provably remove the share and make that share now invalid using a zero-knowledge proof, you now have control of the key, provably, and it hasn't happened on block. So we're going to release ways of doing off-block transfers that are instantaneous, that appear, and also don't require any protocol changes. So we also have hierarchies. So we can set this any way we want. Say we've got an n equals 100 in our organisation. I can have a threshold value um, of 61 shares required to vote. And I can set up um, each of these little bits of the hierarchy so that we have Someone has 15 shares, 15, 15, 45 in the distributed part down here, etc. 
And if you're Mark Zuckerberg and you want to have your 25% uh, of the shares in your family but still have 50% of control, you can. However you want to create any DAC voting organisation, whatever else, we can do. So you can make these nice little complex hierarchical structures and it's all in Bitcoin. We can assign seller, obligation, duty. If we can assign goods, we can assign ownership. And once we start opening up tokens again, and we put this on the blockchain, then we assign everything. So I want you to think about, instead of an ICO and a how do I raise a $100 billion scam, think about someone having a house. Think, instead of a housing crisis, you have 5% equity in your home. How about you put out a, a smart contract linked to what you will do, your payment schedule. If you don't pay, some of your rent that you didn't pay comes out of your equity. If you do pay, you buy on market more of your house. You go out there and you raise it based on a deal. And not because 50% say X, Y or Z and control things, but because you've actually put down what you will do. And if you maintain your house, we have an incentive now, not to, like renters do, trash the place, we have an incentive to actually increase the value. We also have other ways of thinking about this in that, for instance, if there is a housing crash, there's a depression, there's whatever else, it's a great time now as a homeowner to actually buy a little bit more of your home because you're no longer underwater. If you actually own equity rather than debt, you never go negative. Your 5% remains your 5%. And if the house halves in value and you were going to buy another 5%, now you buy 10. So, not a bad system. Assignment. If we can start trading these things, think of what insurance becomes when we start housing around the world. I want to own a percentage in Sydney, a percentage in Brisbane, a little bit in New York, somewhere in a Cherokee territory, somewhere in London, because in diversifying my portfolio, I decrease my risk. I decrease my risk of something happening to any of the properties, of someone defaulting, of someone going bad on their loan. And I can automate this, not in hierarchies of CDOs that no one can ever understand that are probably 100 million pages long, but in something that I can click a button and actually have an answer from an automated system. That's what Bitcoin will give us. We have exponential growth. Once we start thinking what we can do here, think everything that we can tack to all these systems. Once we can start instantly transferring shares and matching values, we can have fast transactions, not the small type of stuff, things that uh, other people who, uh, Mike Hearn was very good with this one, the whole idea of instantaneous transfers of wealth between people with shares so that you can do fast trades algorithmically, not a bad thing. So, tokens, they are a financial instrument. ICOs are financial instruments and they enable us to actually do transfers without intermediaries. They enable us to start opening up global commerce. When we can start actually tokenizing access to music, tokenizing access to someone's home, to selling um, an experience, etc. That's when we start thinking that we don't just have first world, even second world commerce. We have global commerce. If we start thinking the people, the unbanked, the underbanked, we have half the world's population in need. Half the world's population who can be opened up to a bigger economy. Not that little pie, but a pie of size we have never imagined. A global expansion we have never imagined. And it's not because of this word equality that everyone says. I mean, this is a nice little image I found. Equality is everyone standing there equal. It's, 
I have the same as you. There's only one way in this universe to be equal. We can be equally poor. That's it. You can never pull someone up to be equal. You can only drive people down. What matters is equity. Equity is where we start actually building for people and opening up opportunities. And no, even if we start now, even if Africa has 12% growth because of something, it's going to be a long time before they catch up. But that's not the issue. Imagine what the alternative is if it doesn't happen for them. If they sit there stagnating at 3%, 4% growth even, they will get nowhere. They will get further behind. A world where people can trade more ideas, more education, more people offering something is what we're hoping to build. So we don't compete with banks. I don't care what people say. Bitcoin does not compete with banks. If you think it does, you don't understand banking at all. Banks allocate risk. Banks do more than just act as a depository. A bank isn't a depository. There are problems with banks at the moment. The biggest one happens to do with the fact that they have 10% capital reserves, sometimes less, sometimes more, and they get to float money supplies up and down, which was the whole point of the article that the Chancellor was actually there forcing banks to do his whim. That's the problem. Banks react like everyone else. They react to incentives because they're not evil, we're not evil, very few of us are evil. There are some people on this earth who are evil, but the majority of us, well, we might be assholes, we might be curmudgeons, we might be many other things. But the reality is we want to live our lives in peace. Most of us don't want to burn the world down. The majority of the world wants to actually live and trade in harmony, like it or not. We have sources of capital. How do we consolidate them? ICOs, the way they are, aren't that answer. Raising money properly, having a, a decent product, doing what Lighthouse was actually meant to do, what Mike Hearn had worked on, that makes a good basis for something. If you don't raise it, then the money goes back. Many things you can do to actually do this and minimise risk. How do you actually allocate this money? These are the questions we need to think about. So we don't replace all of these features here. We don't change the world, but we do. Not because we're trying to stomp on people. We don't want to wreck anyone's lives. We don't want to burn the world and make it anew. I'm not Mr. Robot, I'm sorry. I want this world better. I don't want equality. I want equity. I don't want to push someone down. I want to help people get up. I want them to have an opportunity to trade. I don't want to give people money. I don't want to hand them a fish. I want to teach them how they can be part of the world. That's what Bitcoin does. That's why we don't want to burn the system down. That's what it can do. That's the promise of this system. Exchanging wealth, not because of government controls, the first thing that happens whenever we have government-based um, capital is capital flight. Anyone remember the Mexican currency crisis? It's Switzerland. We've got to have some bankers here, don't we? Mm -mm. Okay, long story short, basically what happened was the government was spending too much money issuing bonds. They had their money pegged to the US dollar. Of course, when you peg something to the US dollar and you have a differential, arbitrage. Then a whole lot of nasty speculators came in and arbitraged the hell out of it and, well, Mexico went down the tube. Same thing happened in Thailand. A whole lot of bonds, everyone thought that, hey, government backing, yay. Except those people in the government who see problems talk to their big friends. And their big friends get out first. That's what capital flight is. It's not like we can do with Bitcoin. It's not a synonymous system that doesn't need government, that makes everyone on a level playing field. 
It's where we're mates. Got to help our mates, don't we? The future of Bitcoin. So that screen image is from my computer in 2013. Um, it's also there. That's part of a database structure that we're still building. One day we'll finish it. Um, in 2013, I talked to a company called Temenos. Anyone heard of them? A couple people. Um, I tried to get them to help me build a core banking platform for Bitcoin. Evil, I know. They couldn't. So we've spent a few years in other projects that we didn't want to talk about, and this is one of them. Um, so yes, I have a core banking platform that is actually derived on Bitcoin. Fiat tokenized on Bitcoin. Bitcoin on Bitcoin. Assets tokenized on Bitcoin. What can I say? I'm a maximalist. So, this is what we want. We want not Aldous Huxley's brave new world. I want Adam Smith's brave new world. Do you know what Adam Smith's other two books are about? Anyone? Uh, Wealth of Nations and that 20 page title that he had. No? Virtue. The guy wrote on virtue. The heart of capitalism is not mercantilism. It is not crony capitalism. It is not how do we exploit people. It's how do I trade? How do I do a deal where we both benefit? That's what we want to build. So, um, and chain have been rather secret for quite some time. And yes, I'm still employed there, strangely enough, contrary to what all these things have said and whatever else. And I'm going to be kept, um, there for a while. And I'm not going to tell you my whole life. The end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does it work? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, got it working. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Craig. Uh, Dr. Wright. Um, uh, I was uh, born in Zimbabwe and uh, I live in South Africa now. And uh, as you can imagine, there's enormous appetite for Bitcoin. Um, and uh, for the last year, I've been uh, building products that kind of fill that question mark between your Bitcoin and your profit, uh, helping Africans use Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. we've got a whole lot of ways for them to get it and to spend it and uh, remit it across border. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I've, because I've been in the space for quite a long time working with the banks on blockchain, uh, I've managed to uh, get very friendly with the Reserve Bank, our South African Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so I advise them and do workshops with them around blockchain. Uh, so they're very friendly, actually, towards this hmm. idea of Bitcoin, and they're allowing me to build these products out and to um, you know, try and make Bitcoin actually usable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, in fact, why I'm, I'm delighted with Bitcoin Cash, because it makes Bitcoin actually usable for Africans? Well, it gives it the scale. It's not usable yet. We still need a friendly wallet. Ah, okay. So now this is, this is exactly what I'm doing. Uh, I'm building out Good. all that. Happy mm -hmm. to show it to you if you like. Um, but eventually, more and more people will use Bitcoin, and um, it's going to start taking over. So how do you envision the central bank looking at it one day when people live and move, move and breathe within Bitcoin, and there? Monopoly of a currency obviously becomes a problem. All right, I hate to say this. Even Keynesians can use Bitcoin. <laughs> I really hate to say this because the idea of neo-Keynesian um, thought has been corrupted. Now, what happens now is um, debt instruments. Now, the original idea of Keynes, and I have to keep saying this, I don't like Keynes, um, Keynes had, uh, the, the quote I like to say is, Keynes had a theory designed to keep Keynes a lord. And that's what it's about. Keynes had an idea that in the good times, governments would be able to save money. They would then be able to draw down on the savings in the bad time. Now, Keynes was also very foolish. He might have been in the House of Lords and might have been whatever else, but he never really understood government. Because the reality is, in the good times, governments spend money. 
In the bad times, governments spend money. That's the problem. So Bitcoin can actually work for reserve banks. In the good times, when there's a boom, and they're getting revenue in and everything's working, that can actually be fiscally sensible and save money. They can start planning. You know, all these things in Europe, they're saying, we shouldn't have to do. Like the Spanish government at the moment saying, we shouldn't have to do this. Why does the uh, naughty EU try and constrain us? And the Greeks did the same and yada, yada, yada. But they can. And here's the great thing with it. You can't cheat. Um, China wants a, a gold standard again. There's a reason China owns the majority of the world's gold at the moment, unmined. So the Americans have got a whole lot sitting there and China has all the stuff in the ground because no one's mined gold in China because they used to think silver was better. Now they've got a big ton of gold that they've uh, worked out they can sort of dig up and the Americans aren't happy because, well, we don't want a gold standard if those guys have got more. But Bitcoin allows it. It allows your reserve bank to actually have monetary policy that is responsible. You know, what they promise to do. Where's the next question? Um, when you gave birth to uh, Bitcoin, why did you call it Bitcoin? I mean, coin is just like... Uh, <laughs> The worst thing to this describe uh, the, the, the blockchain and uh, we have to live now with um, this picture. <laughs> all right, that, that's a loaded question <laughs> um, that I'm not going to address for many reasons. But if I was naming something, um, no one would be happy with the name. Um, I had a company in Australia that everyone thought was weird because it was called Chaos and for uh, Financial uh, Forecasting in um, um, Economic... Um, uh, systems and um, PDY Limited and everyone said that's a terrible name for a company and I went but that's what it does so anyway okay next question <laughs> you, at least you tried I guess yeah <laughs> I think it's worth a try Well, I just have a little question. Why did you make um, the nonce as small as it is now? And what's your opinion on ASIC boost? Uh, um, another loaded question. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, ASICs are not an issue. ASIC boost is not an issue. What you're actually getting um, with the non-existent um, analysis that has been done to discredit it, um, is probably at best if it was actually to work uh, and it would be probabilistic maybe a five percent revenue gain which equates to under a one percent gain now it's also easy to detect which means you would actually be advertising the fact that you're doing it as you're getting one percent revenue it's probably not a good thing as a miner now there are also attacks that I won't go into if you are ASIC boosting. So there are ways of blocking blocks made with ASIC boost, all sorts of things. So it, it's a possibility, who cares? But at the same time, ASICs aren't bad. The idea of centralization is flawed. We don't get more centralized by having bigger machines. I keep pointing out that Newman Strogwitz and whatever else, back when they got themselves a whole lot of awards and got into science, came up with the idea of a small world network. This is the thing that inspired the um, six degrees of Kevin Bacon and whatever else. This is the idea of interconnectivity and in, in sorts of networks that we have with Bitcoin. Not meshes, not loosely coupled systems that end up with diversified giant nodes, which means little groups um, having to go through centralized control, but basically everyone talking to everyone. And large machines, large networks doing that are actually incredibly efficient. They are, Bitcoin without Raspberry Pis is the most efficient computer network on earth, like it or not. And people can say, oh, but you're sending everything, but you have to send everything to every node anyway. 
That's the whole point. Every node that in, is involved with this gets it, but they get it in one hop most of the time. And that means they don't replay. They don't sit there bouncing around the network 50 times. That's why it's important to actually have powerful machines. It's also, and I'll plug a paper that no one ever reads, um, that I published back at originally in 2011. It was to do with territorial nature of botnets and, um, and mining of all these things that were prevalent at the time. Because Bitcoin was actually being used in 2011 and 2010, well, as a source of revenue for a whole lot of guys in the Russian business network and other such things. What they would do is get five, 10 million machines, sometimes, that were the largest ones, were 20, uh, 20 million, and mine Bitcoin. And then you have the bad guys, the dishonest people running Bitcoin network. The people who care about short-term gains and don't have an investment and don't care as much about losing something they're gonna lose anyway. ASICs change that. ASICs create a power differential such that those 10 million machines are less powerful than a 1% miner is today. That 1% miner can take out any group of botnets that want to come and try and attack Bitcoin. So at the end of the day, the network becomes more robust. It becomes stronger. It becomes faster. It has more power that needs to be reversed. And that's what we want. It's not about running your own node and sitting there going, I'm part of the network. It's about having a network that distributes transactions from me to you fast and settles them fast. Peer-to-peer -peer doesn't mean that we have this big mesh. That's a fallacy. Peer-to-peer -peer means I send a transaction to you. So I've got this guy, and I'll pick on him at the moment, and I want to do a transaction with him. I write my transaction to send him money. I don't care. Quite frankly, I don't care. He does. When I give him that transaction, he cares that it gets to the network, not me. The original version of Bitcoin um, up for the first year had IP to IP protocol. The whole nature of that was so that me to you. That enabled sending directly. That's what peer-to-peer -peer is. Not all the nodes get my transaction and everyone runs a node. That's not peer-to-peer. -peer. Nodes getting a transaction isn't peer-to-peer. -peer. You and I directly exchanging cash is peer-to-peer. -peer. So I hope that answers your question about ASICs and ASIC list. Okay, so I have uh, one remark and one question. Uh, the remark is you might want to check your references on equity and equality because uh, equity is actually a socialist idea of redistribution of wealth. Uh, and, uh, se and the real question is, uh, why did you claim to be Satoshi when you clearly are not? Number one, uh, equity was actually an introduced well before that. The concept goes back to, um, uh, actually, it was mentioned in a Greek play called The Frogs by Aristophanes. It's also used widely by Adam Smith. Equity and whatever else is not a socialist idea. It is one that socialists try and subvert, the same way they subvert many things. And I'm not saying whether I am or not. I'm also told that I didn't have a whole pile of degrees that I've now brought in. Um, yeah. So there. Okay, next question. Hi, hi. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, I'm, I'm a physicist uh, and I'm also working in the risk uh, environment for banking. Uh, first question would be, could you comment on the Nash equilibrium? Um, because I think this is one really major aspect of the, of the force that is anti-centralization. And the other thing is, in principle, the risk. Because I see if you have lots of mining and lots of central environments there, they care a lot of risk there and they are, in the end, they, they, they will split up. So it's also against the centralization. 
you have competition. The core of mining is competition. It's capitalist. That means you have people competing, developing new things, whatever else. It is Schumpeterian. We have people moving from FPA, uh, FPGAs to ASIGs to 13, to 11, to 10, to 8, etc. In nanometers and smaller, more efficient, more energy efficient systems. We find people moving location, not because they want to be in China or out of China or whatever else, but to where the most money and profit is made. You don't collude with people, and that's not a risk. The risk, what you're saying, isn't really there. It's not because of physics, it's not because of whatever else, it's because of game theory. In economics, and not because of the typical Nash equilibria of a prisoner's dilemma or whatever else, because even those fail when you have multiplayer games, when you have multi-game games. Anyone knows what happens to a prisoner's dilemma when you have repeated play with unknown length of game? No? The typical prisoner's dilemma um, and bad scenario falls apart. People start cooperating. When you know that, as a prisoner, if you dob in this guy, that, well, I've got family out there and other criminals, etc., and I'm going to be going into jail with a whole pile of criminals who don't like tattlers, then I have a different game. So the problem we have with some of these economic theories at the moment is we like to isolate them. Cerebrus paribus, all things equal. All things aren't equal. And we don't have a Samuelson uh, type equilibrium because the interesting bits are what happens off the equilibrium. Anyone who's traded knows equilibriums exist at a fleeting moment. That's it. Every tick, every nanosecond is a different equilibrium, a different arbitrage opportunity and a different world. So, no, I don't see the risk. Sorry? There's a local equilibrium, uh, local equilibrium, yes, for a nanosecond. As electricity prices change, it changes. We have asymmetric information, so you don't know what your competition's doing. You can plan, you can hope, you can analyze, but you don't know when they get new machines. You don't know when machines break. You don't know what rates they get. You can try and analyze and, and hope that, uh, oh, well, obviously they've got um, better power at um, off-peak because they're bringing more machines on at this time and less machines at this time. And then someone else brings a new machine in and it screws up your calculations. Um, and Stefan will quite happily talk to you about mining if you want to have a conversation. Uh, well, he's already pulled his hair out, so too late. <laughs> Next. Hello, my name is Wolfgang Lohmann. My first, uh, I, I became aware of Bitcoin in 2011 while I was preparing a study on resource consumption of software. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we have 2017 and hardware is uh, developing exponentially. Mm -hmm. Could you give us your opinion on the energy aspect of Bitcoin in the future? Thanks. Bitcoin is actually incredibly efficient. Everyone talks about how much electricity it chews up. The reality is, it chews up less than Citibank. If Bitcoin was to scale out to be the sole global anything on earth for finance, it would chew up less energy than Citibank today. Citibank have more computational waste, more heat, more computers, more electricity, running databases that are not immutable, that are highly inefficient, that half the time run on COBOL, still, that fall over, that lose info, that have people running around panicking, that get hacked, then Bitcoin, today. So, and yes, there are people laughing, and every bank out there has been hacked multiple times, Every bank out there has lost money multiple times, not just Visa, 
Every single one of them. It's just within bounds of fraud. We had a nice little uh, loss where someone nearly got away with $100 billion a little while ago, uh, about a year, when they basically did a swift transfer between central banks. And um, unfortunately, they put the commas in the wrong place because they didn't understand the difference between different cultures and only got 100 million instead of 100 billion. But hey, things happen. So I think it's incredibly efficient and it gets more efficient over time. The wonderful thing with Bitcoin and ASICs and all the rest is as we're scaling up, the cost of electricity isn't scaling at the same level to the amount of use that we can get. Hi, my name is Simon Geren. <coughs> I'm just a simple Bitcoin user. Um, my question would be, it sort of goes into the hoarding, but not of central governments, the bullionism, mm -hmm. but more of people. <coughs> because like with, as a simple user now of current volatility vis-a-vis -vis to fiat, you always feel when you sometimes actually want to use my Bitcoin, and I have used them, but then I think like, oh, now I lost so and so much in Bitcoin and it angers me. And what do you think about the volatility problem? Because banks, for example, don't like volatility. I think I agree. No, they don't. But that's where we need to start actually setting up some um, evil derivative markets, as people like to think of them, and um, start actually allowing hedging. When we can start doing things like options, swaptions, uh, long puts, and complex derivatives, then we can actually create a system where in the small period that you're not um, able to get in there and top up your account, then you haven't lost anything. Enabling you to go out there and risk your Bitcoin and use it because it's simpler, and at the same time, capture any gains or losses, depending on how you do it. And so um, we're talking already, that's one of the things we want to get done in the next year. Uh, has it been built yet? No. Do we want one? Yes. Okay. Two questions left. I think I had one behind here. Yes, sorry. Okay, I've given the two. <coughs> um, hi, thanks for your talk. I was wondering, um, in five years, do you think Bitcoin is going to retain its current positioning? Is it rather going to decrease in importance or increase in importance? And. Um, in light of that, what do you think a current fair valuation should be? Um, my answer will be Bitcoin is Bitcoin Cash, and I think it will go up incredibly. In the next little while, you'll start to see it used more and more, and I can't give you any details, but there'll be merchant deals, and there'll be people starting to use it. There'll be simpler wallets, and um, we have technology that will be starting to push out there and develop well, quite heavily, um, and release, and that will open up the ability to easily use it. Um, we, as soon as we can, we've got some deals with exchanges and other such things where we'll start actually opening up the ability to short and do futures and everything like that deal so that you don't lose your Bitcoin when you go and buy a hot dog or a coffee. Important stuff. And over time, it will go up because it's being used. Not because people are hoarding it. Here's the thing. If everyone just hoards Bitcoin, where do we end? The housing crisis in, in um, 2006 happened because we kept saying everyone needs to own a house. We need to get people who can't afford to pay a loan and get them to own a house. We need to put people and buy a house no matter what. And for what reason? People were buying two, three houses and not living in them, not even renting them because they thought they could flip them and make money. And that's what's happening right now in Bitcoin, um, in SegwitCoin anyway. In Bitcoin, we're going to create it to be a payment system. And if they want to compete by being a settlement system in, in core, good, I'm not going to stop them. I'm not going to be mean and nasty and fight them. We're just going to make a damn good payment system. We're going to make a good cash. And we're going to scale it out and I've said this many times on Twitter and other things, I have one little goal in life. I want five billion people using Bitcoin on a daily basis. And then, then it's worth something. Hello, Mr. Wright. Um, I'm also a big fan of uh, Bitcoin Cash. 
And uh, do you think we need to make a better uh, promotion for that or uh, better marketing? Because uh, like I see Bitcoin, I mean, it's uh, incredibly valuable, but you cannot, uh, people are not using it. Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin Cash allows you to use it, but uh, right now it's so unpopular. So uh, what are your thoughts on, thoughts on that? I Thank think you. once people see it is able to be used in many ways, that will change it. But yes, we need to market it. And I'm not saying that it's a single person job. And we are doing things, some of which you'll start to see. Um, got partnerships with some friends of mine um, who I've dug up from the gaming industry because they love it. Um, I used to deal with um, uh, Playboy Casino, so I've got some other industries that will be using it. Um, what we'll to say other industries? Um, because gambling and other industries are a big part of what grows anything on the internet, like it or not. And once we start people using it for gaming and other things, then eventually we'll get back to the situation where people use it for coffee. And merchants will start seeing it used more, start seeing the value, and once they see it more, that's where it starts to take off.